Hello! <clears throat> few minutes early, but I thought I'd check out the, uh, check out everything's working. Can you hear everything fine? Let me know if you can hear everything, because <laughs> obviously a few, uh, Weeks ago, we had all the problem with the uh, with the sound. Oh, it sounds like it's working. I'm having to monitor over here. I, I normally have all the sound turned off because I'm coming through headphones, but that's only local sound. So um, I'm just hoping everything works fine. Why is that on analytics? Let me get that off. Okay. There's all these new things in the YouTube back end. So that should all be coming through. Strings are a bit dead on this. So we got Pam in. Hi, Pam. Some of the old favourites here. So yeah, so I've not done a, a live stream on YouTube for ages. Um, well, actually, sorry, I tell a lie. I did one when the um, when we got the new thing going at the website. Um, so I thought I'd do a little bit of a um, just a. Well, actually, there's a reason. It's because <laughs> uh, we're actually having a sale over at uh, Talking Bass. So I thought I'd do a, a live stream that gets out to everybody rather than the one that we have just at the website, which has been causing problems lately with the sound and everything. But, um... oh, no. So you've got the timing problem. Hold on. Oh, no, it sounds okay here. We had the loop. That was the thing that happened last time where we had a loop going round and round and round. If it happens, I'll have to abandon ship because it was pretty bad. Uh, that's the audio guy saying that. Audio timing problem on this end. It sounds like delay. Um, I mean, you shouldn't really have any delay. I've got the delay set up properly on it. The The delay from of my, you know, the visual and the audio, that should be fine. You might need to re... Um, refresh the page let me just yeah i can see that that's fine on there uh the problem we had was a, a, a huge loop going on i mean it was crazy it was like a it was overlaying itself like multiple times it turned into like a dmt trip it was just like doo, 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 doo. <laughs> so um yeah so that's good and how many we got in so we got 15 at the moment that's not bad um so today, um, so yeah, uh, I'll, uh, we're having a sale, uh, an end of summer sale over at Talking Bear. So that's 30% off all the courses. So I'll get that out of the way first. Um, so if any of you haven't bought any courses before over at Talking Base, or you want to get some more, then you can go grab a bargain over there. Uh, we've got like beginner bass guitar, basic fundamentals, sight reading course. The sight reading course is, is that's three volumes long now. Um, chord tone essentials, scale essentials, chords for bass guitar, blah, 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 ear training. There's all those things. So that's all there. Also, in case you've not been over to the website lately, um, about, what was it, a month and a half ago now, massive changes over at the website. So we've now got this huge network, uh, t uh, social network thing going on. So... Uh, you, you, when you sign in, there's all the stuff that there used to be, like the 25 bass riff challenge and all that stuff. There's all the scales and arpeggios, all those things. The ebooks, all that stuff's still there. All your courses are in the same place. But now there's forums, groups. You can connect with other uh, members. I'm going to be doing more. Uh, there's going to be a live hang thing going on there as soon as I can sort out all this audio thing. Um, which I'm now thinking is an interface between the website and the RMTP that I've got, uh, RTMP. And um, so, yeah, so there's a huge big social network there. So you can, you know, create your own groups like you would in Facebook. There's 
all the forums you can talk on there. Meet up with loads of people, and there's about a hundred thousand. Well, there's more. There's about one hundred twenty thousand, I think now. Uh, one hundred twenty thousand people signed up, so plenty of bass players to talk to. So um, yeah, go check that out if you've not checked it out already. Uh, and today. Uh, oh, I don't know if you've all seen the video that I released yesterday that was uh, all about uh, rhythm. It was about anticipation of uh, rhythm. Uh, basically, um, well, I say hmm, not not pickup bars, really. I mean, it was kind of like pickup bars, uh, a pickup bar that I used as an example or an anacrusis. Uh, but uh, it's it's not. It's just about anticipating rhythm, which can be done over the bar line or it can be done across the middle of the bar line. I mean, there's a whole load of ways. I mean, it's basically syncopation. Uh, but I've got a whole video out on that. Today, uh, I'm going to do a little bit of a workshop or oh, masterclass, I suppose you could call it, on um, chord tones and arpeggios. Uh, I'll tell you why you use them, why they're handy, and uh, how you'd use them, and how to create them what the, 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 because you see with you'll hear about chord tones a lot and arpeggios and you know you'll hear everybody talking about how chord tones are the are the key to being able to do stuff on on bass you know play through chord progressions and all that kind of stuff you know and the arpeggios are and chord tones are much more important than scales you'll hear all of this stuff but very rarely do I actually see any kind of um comprehensive works through uh, work throughs of all the different chord types so what you'll basically get is okay well this is a major triad this is a minor triad maybe uh, augmented and diminished but then usually they'll pass on to major seven minor seven dominant seven and minor seven flat five so you normally get those four that's the kind of four essential ones that you get but there's a ton more than that i mean if you think about all the different odd chord progressions that you've seen or you just pull out any kind of jazz standard and have a look at the chords that you'll see in there you'll see things like with sharp fives and flat fives and extensions like ninths eleventh, thirteenths, flat ninths sharp elevens flat thirteens uh add nine chords Add nine, six nine, minor nine, minor six nine, sus four chords, sus two chords, all combined in all these different ways. And all you ever get on any kind of lessons, including ones that I'll do, is, is like major seven, minor seven, dominant seven, and minor seven flat five. A lot of the time, major seven, minor seven, and dominant seven. Because they're the most common, you know, that, that's why um, it's pointless applying all the stuff that you're going to learn to, you know, Dominant seven flat nine sharp uh, nine flat thirteen sharp eleven chords. You know, <laughs> it's like okay, well, we'll use that as the example for everything. Um, obviously, it's a bit much, but there are very very simple rules that you can that you just need to learn. I've I've got to say that when I, I, one of the main things that I learned early on at music college when I first started there uh, in harmony lessons. Um, there was one day in particular, I remember I remember it really well. It was raining outside, it was dark, so it was probably, and we were in about, it was about five o'clock, half four, something like that, and it was dark outside, so it must have been December sometime. And uh, it was, I know it was raining, and I remember the harmony tutor working through the basics of uh, chord construction and how chords are made uh, basically tertian harmony so uh, you you've probably seen me talk about this on uh, on youtube on various lessons where you build up out of thirds which i'll talk about in a minute so there was basically that and then how you would then create chords in a key by using that system so you can make three note chords triads you can make uh, four note chords five, five note chords whatever you want based on this set of thirds and it was like this huge big light bulb because I'd, as, as a bass player, and even as an organist before I ever played bass, I didn't really know the nuts and bolts of what chord construction was, why these, what, how you made these chords. To me, it was just like, oh, um, you get some notes and put them together and that's it. And then kind of make a name for it based on what it is. But there's, there's very, very specific rules that uh, that govern this in the creation of them and reasons why they're called what they are. And if and so what you really need is to learn the chord construction principles 
And then all of those chords that you'll see on a, a, a lead sheet or, or whatever, you know, all these crazy chords, they're really simple when you know the, the basics of how they work and what uh, those chord constructions are and why the chord symbol is like it is. You know, if I was to say, oh, uh, do you know the notes in, or, or can you play a major triad? Most of you probably kind of know. Um, but if I said, can you play the arpeggio four, a dominant nine, a sharp 11 chord or or even something like a, 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 a maybe a, 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 a D flat 6 9 chord and if I said do you know what that is if you saw it on a chord progression well do you know what the chord tones are a lot of you might not know you might be able to kind of work it out but would you know exhaustively what all of those chords are no matter what it is on the chord chart if someone gives you a chord chart would you know all the notes from all those chords well, it's not as hard as you think. So I will go through all this in a second. Um, and I'll do a little bit of chordal stuff as I'm going. So we'll cover it mainly as arpeggios. Because if you didn't know, an arpeggio is basically a chord played one note at a time. There's a chord. There's an arpeggio. So an arpeggio is just a, a linear um, line of chord tones. So a chord tone is just a, a, a note of a chord. So if I've got a chord, there's a C major chord, right? Each of those notes, 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 is a chord tone. That's a chord tone, that's a chord tone, that's a chord tone. An arpeggio is an ordered line of them. So, okay, so that's an arpeggio. Individually, they're chord tones. So you can do anything with them as individually. You don't have to play them as arpeggios all the time. If I play through a chord progression like this... playing root notes. I'm still playing chord tones, I'm just playing the root note, because the root note's a chord tone. So we'll be talking about all those. So I will get to that in a second. I'll just have a quick check on who we've got in here. So we've got 116 so far, so that's not bad. Uh, so we've got Pam in, John, Follis. Uh, so I saw all those when I first started. Um, Cool, everybody's getting everything through okay. Uh, about yesterday's lesson, so this is from No Frets 5. Uh, which sight reading course covers that info in deeper detail? Pretty much all of them. Um, so it, it basically the sight reading course, I say it's a sight reading course, it's called Simple Steps to Sight Reading, but it's a reading course, you know, because sight reading is just being able to read well. So um, all of the rhythm... So I, I go through exhaustively through pictures and through rhythm. Uh, I do them both in uh, separately in isolation and then combine them. So, for instance, I'll do uh, at the beginning when we're just covering pitch. We'll start with the the E string there. So you'll be reading just basic whole notes. You know, just going one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Just on the E string. Then the A string. Then you combine them both. Then you add the D string. Then you combine them all. Then you add the G string. And then you combine all those. Man, the light here is getting a bit out of hand, isn't it? Um, I don't know why that is. Um, I don't want to turn it off. Oh, it's because of the light up there as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, just see what happens when I turn that light off. I've got these crazy lights up here. That's a bit better, isn't it? Um, so yeah, so the um, yeah, so I cover that, and then I cover rhythm separately. So we work through whole notes, half notes, quarter notes in all different ways. So we have rests, we have ties, and then eventually we add eighth notes, sixteenth notes, triplets, sixteenth note triplets. Uh, we go through load of duplets, all kinds of stuff in every which way possible. So um, there's ties across bars, across, you know, in every way. So when you can do that and you can read all of that stuff, that stuff that I covered yesterday will be nothing. It will seem really, really straightforward because you already know how to do that. You know all about ties you know, because you've practiced it. So there's, a, there's about 700 pages of practice material in that reading course and you cover everything. Every single note on the bass that you're going to have on a four string. It's pretty much a four string course at the moment. I'm going to add an addendum uh, so that I can do it as a five as well. But um, the same principles apply. I mean, you're only adding four more notes, uh, you know, five more notes down on the bottom for the B string. So, uh, but it's the same principle. So, uh, so yeah, so 
I would start, if you can't read, I'd start with volume one and work through. Um, I'm going to be redoing volume one and two in the new year. I'm not doing any more courses until the new year because this year has been crazy. So um, I just need some time off from doing stuff. I was talking about this in the last um, the last live stream. Anyway, um, that was that question. All right, here we go. Hi, Skip. Skip's in. Cool. Nice one, Martin, Pam. Hi, Russell. At some point, I'll have to be careful with my voice because I've got this blooming acid reflux thing going on where it's <laughs> my throat ends up uh, dying on me. So uh, apologies for that if I start croaking. Uh, do, do, do. Hi, Akram from Turkey. So we've got people in from everywhere here, from Ghana, Kentucky. Me and my missus have been talking about the move to uh, to the US again. I'm trying to learn how to learn patterns on the fretboard so that I can get a pattern any time, if this makes any sense. Uh, yeah, you'd need to give me a bit more info than that. Do you plan on near training part two? Yep, uh, that again will be in the new year sometime so sometime next year basically but i'm just not doing any more courses until the end of this year i know i've only done one this year which is the sight reading volume three but man that took it out of me that was like a year it took me and it was just heavy going um we had a baby during that time so that our third child so um um so that was stressful it's always stressful having new kids so we've now got three kids and so we've been going through all that uh, then i had all the thing to do with getting all the new um the new website sorted with all the social networking stuff. And remember, I do all this myself. I'll have a little bit of help from people at certain times, but uh, the majority of it from the video editing to the video recording to the course creation to the writing of the material, the transcription, the marketing, the website design, the website development, every single thing is me. So you can imagine I'm a bit rushed off my feet at the best of times. So uh, all the artwork, the, everything, every single thing that's to do with Talking Bass is pretty much me. Uh, Ellen's been doing the less, uh, the interviews at times. Uh, there's another friend of mine that does some of my SEO and does uh, Google ads when I need them. Um, and he'll help me out when we've got some things to do where it's really going to be a two-man job. Um, but uh, yeah, most of the time it's just me. I think some people have got this idea that I've got this big company where we've got like you know so that because sometimes i'll get emails and there'll be people going oh can you tell mark this or blah 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 and they think they're talking to like some customer service thing <laughs> it's just going to my phone you know so i've got all that going on as unprofessional as that sounds okay so There ain't nothing here for you in the USA. It's a wasteland over here. We've been looking at houses over the past... Um, um, uh, I'll, I'll be quick on this, but we've just been house hunting uh, and looking around. Uh, and we're on the Isle of Wight. And man, if you think it's bad over there for various things, I mean, the, pri the house prices over here at the moment are ridiculous. Uh, like... I think anybody, even if you're living in LA or New York, you'd come over here and look at the house prices that we've got going on. Um, I mean, because remember, when, I, I'm not talking London. I'm talking, you know, the Isle of Wight. And uh, they're, they're silly for what you get as well. They're really daft. And the, and the rental prices have gone absolutely crazy. So, um, yeah, we were thinking about that last year and we've been sort of toying with it again. I, I don't know. We've got... F future changes coming up. Um, da -da -da. Ch -ch -ch. <laughs> Don't come to California. It's funny because, like, it used to be that you'd talk to people about like moving over to the states and that, and then everybody'd be like, "Oh, come on over, do this." And now all I've got is like, "Don't come over, uh, don't come over." The place we were looking at is Houston, so we're thinking of moving to Houston. But um, that's it's going to be a couple of years at least if we do it. And you know, I I, I don't really want to leave uh, necessarily. It's just that we've got um, it's almost like we're being forced out in some ways. So um, yeah, it's it's getting nuts. 
on the Isle of Wight this year alone, it's gone up twenty two percent as the house um, of the house prices. We looked at one the other day, um, um, and it's like to get like a let's say a, what was it? A, uh, we looked at a it was a pretty small by American standards. It was small, right? And, um, you know, because I know that they talk in terms of square feet. So you probably, I mean, you don't get houses over here that are like, you know, 1,500 square feet and 2,000 square feet. I know that over there, it's like 4,000 square feet and all that for it. But it just doesn't happen over here. We don't have the space. So, and you know, 11,000 square foot lots. You know, you're lucky if you get like two over here. So you've got these smaller places. And like a lot of the houses over here, unless you go for like a small terraced house or a small uh, a semi in a much worse area, you're looking at like anything between 400 and 700,000 um pounds which when you do the math and turn that into dollars you can imagine so you're upwards of the 800 900 thousand to a million for a for something that most americans would probably see that have got a normal sort of sized uh detached house they'd probably look at it and go what the hell is that <laughs> I know that because I've talked to some Americans about it when they see the houses that we have over here. And I'm not saying anything necessarily that bad about England, but like, you know, the that a lot of the houses over here comparatively are like tiny compared to what you get in the States. But that's just because of the land. You know, you've just got way more land over there. So anyway. Um Oh, that's an awesome shirt. I've got the Frank Zappa thing on. Okay, so we've got 143 in now, so um, we're, um, oh, and by the way, when I said that about the, uh, about it being expensive, um, <laughs> that didn't mean I could afford a million pound house, by the way, it's, um, you know, that makes me sound like I'm going for these huge houses, it's not, it's just that they're the only ones available, so that, and that's why we're not buying, because <laughs> they're way too expensive, so, um, yeah, so anyway, um, I'll, I'll, do a bit on all of this um, chord tone business. God, it's getting hot in here. It's blooming raining outside. So, first things first, right? If you ever want to learn about chord tones, arpeggios, any of that, or even scales, the main thing that you first need to learn is intervals. Now, I'm not going to spend too long on intervals because it's um, it can get a bit heavy. So, I'll I'll just give you a, a, an indication of what intervals are. So what's an interval, okay? Most of you probably know, but an interval is a uh, measurement of, of musical distance, right? Now, here's a thing that a lot of you probably um, have problems with, and you won't even realize it. You'll confuse scale degrees and intervals, right? They're two different things, but they sound like they're the same thing. So if I've got a C major scale, okay? Now, the first thing that you'll find is that when people are talking about intervals, and me included, we'll say, okay, number those notes. So we're in C major there. Um, we've got C, D, E, F, G, A, B, then up to C. So you number them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then you're back to one, because that's the C. They are scale degrees. Back in the old days, they wouldn't even be named that way. You would have tonic, which is why it's uh, called the tonic. Tonic, supertonic, median, and then subdominant, dominant, then submediant, leading tone, and then you'd be back up to the tonic. That's what they are called in sort of classical terms. That's the scale degrees. But we just say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, right? So that's um that's scale degrees. Now we call them the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh. Intervals add something in there. We add a quality to it. Now, it just so happens that the main uh, ones that you normally use are from the are taken from the major scale. So if you were to look at the intervals that are there in the major scale, you would have the perfect unison. Ignore that one. That's the first, right? That's what it's called, the unison, because uh, we're talking harmony. So that's the perfect unison. Then we've got the major second, the major third, the perfect fourth, the perfect fifth, the major sixth, and the major seventh. And then we're back. Well, and then we're at the perfect octave. Remember what I said about measurements of musical distance? That now becomes the eighth. If it was a scale degree, we're back to one, right? Bear with me. 
So from the major scale, we derive those intervals. So if we want to go from C to D, it's a major second. If I want to go from C to E, it's a major third. That's the key part of it. We're going from somewhere to somewhere, right? C to E, that's a major third. C to F, that's a perfect fourth. In terms of scale degrees, that F is just a fourth. It would be a fourth whether I'm there, there, you know, there, there, wherever I am, it's just a fourth of C major, right? That's scale degree, interval, perfect fourth, distance. C to F, C to F, C to... If I do C to F up here, it's going to be an 11th, okay? So when you get up to the octave, we call it the octave, perfect octave, it's an eighth, right? So C up to a D up here, that's a ninth. C up to the, uh, as I was mentioning before, if you got to the, uh, oh, well, if you got up to the E, it's going to be the twelfth. Uh, sorry, the tenth, <laughs> which I talked about a couple of weeks ago. So that's the tenth, and then up to the eleventh, twelfth. So you don't really talk about the twelfth much, that's the fifth, an octave higher. And then up to the thirteenth. 14th, which is the 7th, and then up to the 15th, okay? So you just keep going. You could 16th, 17th, whatever. They're intervals, right? Now, it just so happens, depending on what the chord symbol is, you know, you might have 9th, you might have 2nd, you know, there's. you just have to accept the way that they're commonly done, but I'll get to those in a minute. So that's the first thing. Scale degrees and intervals are different, even though most people don't seem to realize it, right? So... Like I said, a scale degree is just a, a tone of that scale. So if we're in C major, C is the root, it's the first, whether regardless of the register. But if I'm doing C up to C like that, or C up to C like that, that's an octave, that's a, or an eighth. That's intervals, right? And it always has that major or minor or perfect or whatever. Uh, just as a little extra on that, so that's your that's your that's your intervals there. Um, wherever you move with them, C to E, C to E, that's always going to be a major third. You, regardless of the note that you're measuring from. So if I'm on G and I want to measure a major third, that would be a B. Okay, so you basically, I'm just sort of skimming over this. Intervals are the building blocks of music. They are the most important thing. If you're going to go down the music theory road and the sort of uh, personal development and, you know, autodidactic kind of uh, pathway, really, you want to learn about intervals above all else. Don't worry about scales. Don't worry about... I mean, you've got to learn a major scale to do that bit, but don't worry about, oh, Dorian mode, Mixolydian mode, Superlocrian mode. Don't worry about that at all. Don't worry about even arpeggios to begin with. Get the intervals down. Learn that. Because everything is based on intervals. They are the building blocks. Everything's constructed out of intervals. And you'll find, if you don't know much about intervals and the, and the terminology, when it comes to somebody describing, as I'm about to do, describing chord construction or scale construction or how you analyze melodies or how you analyze whatever bass lines, however that is described is usually by way of intervals. So you have to have your intervals down. I've noticed sometimes when I've done um, lessons on YouTube and then you get the comments and then people are like, oh man, this sounds like a lot of waffle. You know, oh man, this sounds complicated. And it's just because I'm talking in intervallic terminology. I'm talking of intervals and those people might not know them. And so if you don't know what a perfect tenth, uh, 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 not a perfect tenth, major tenth and a minor tenth is, or a major a major ninth, you know, when you see these chords that have got thirteenths, elevenths, and ninths, it's like, ooh, sophisticated jazz, man. <laughs> and it's not. It's just a simple interval. You get that basics done first, all the basics of intervals, and that all makes sense later on, right? So I'm not going to spend a load of time on intervals because, like I said, it can get it can get complicated, but you basically want to know your basic major and perfect intervals, which are part of the, which you derive from the major scale. But then, another important point: minor intervals are not based on minor scales. That's the other thing people mess up. They think that minor intervals are taken from a minor scale. They're not. Once you've got those major and perfect ones from the major scale, all the other ones are derived from them. So. 
If I take a C to E, right? And by the way, don't get too caught up in fretboard patterns with this because remember, C to E can be there, C to E can be there. I mean, if I had a C here, you could play it there, there, there. It's all the same thing. So you have to get used to the notes themselves or at least if you're going to do it all by pattern, you've got to do it by multiple patterns, right? So you'd need to know that C to E there, C to E there along one string, uh, or if you were there, C to E like down here. So anyway, um, the, uh, yeah, so if I take a, a major third, C to E, right? We take the top note and we drop it down a half step, which is basically a fret. And that is how we create a minor third. It's nothing to do with the minor scale. Yeah, it's in the minor scale, but it's nothing to do with that. It's a, a variation on that major. And you'll see why in a second, because I'm going to get to some of the other ones. So there's a minor. So all we do with, to create a, a minor second is we take the major second, C to D, and we drop that top note down a half step. So it's C to D flat. Remember what I said about it? it's not in the major, uh, it's nothing to do with the minor scale. You can see there, there's no minor second from the root note in that minor scale. It's a major second. You've got a minor second there and you've got a minor second there, but you've got a minor second in the major scale if you do it that way. So there you go. There's the minor second interval. Major sixth. You've got a minor sixth if you drop that down. So any major, major interval, you drop that top note down a half step, you get a minor interval. Simple, right? So you learn your major intervals, and then you can easily learn your minor intervals. C to E, major third, C to E flat, minor third. If you take a perfect interval, so let's say a C to G, perfect fifth, drop that top note down a half step, and you get a diminished fifth, flat five. That's why you see it in chord construction terms as flat five, right? Uh, so that's a diminished fifth, and then if you were to raise it, that's an augmented fifth. So raise a perfect one up a, a, a half step, it's augmented. Drop it by a half step and it's diminished. Same with the F there, C to F. The fourth, that's a perfect fourth. Raise that top note by a half step, you get an augmented fourth. Drop it and you get a diminished fourth. And see there how C to that, that third fret of the A string to the second fret of the D string, I just said that's a diminished fourth. And notice how it's exactly the same pattern as a major third. So a major third is the same as a diminished fourth. Yep, all sounds like real, you know, silly music theory stuff, but it's all really important when it comes to sort of getting a good overall grounding in all this stuff. There is a difference between um, a diminished fourth and a major third. There's a different, and think about it, it's called enharmonic equivalency. If you take a C to F sharp, right, or a C to G flat, okay, that note, that tritone, what is it? Is it C to F sharp or is it C to G flat? Is it an augmented fifth or is it a diminished, uh, uh, sorry, an, an augmented fourth or a diminished fifth? That's all based on context and that's the kind of stuff that you kind of have to learn with intervals. See how we haven't even got to the chord construction bit yet, but we're all, we're finding out all this stuff, all this music theory stuff that has a knock-on effect as you go on, right? So if you don't know that, or you don't know what a diminished seventh is, right? So I'll show you what that is in a second. If you don't know what a diminished seventh is, you're going to be, th and you see a diminished seven chord and you're thinking, well, why is that? Why is that a B double flat in a C diminished chord and it's not an A? You know, all that kind of thing. Even though a lot of people will just spell it as an A. But the naming of it, that diminished seven, it's because it's a diminished seventh interval. So if I take a major seventh from C, it's the B, right? Boom, boom. That cool interval, right? Drop a major down a, a half step, we get a flat. Okay, so we get a, a, a minor seventh. So a major seventh minor seventh. If you drop a minor down a half step, it becomes diminished. So you can have a diminished seventh. You can have a diminished third. You can have a diminished sixth. You drop it. It's major, then drop it minor, then drop it diminished. And you can do the same thing with a major. You bring it up one and it becomes augmented. So you could have an augmented octave, right? <laughs> By taking it up a half step. It's just called enharm it's enharmonic equivalency. So it's just two things that look the same, but they're actually spelled different, right? So, oh, someone says, looks like Zappa to me. Yes, it's Zappa. So, 
That's intervals. So you can imagine, if you can kind of get your head around all that, those building blocks of music, all that stuff, all of this other stuff about um, uh, chord construction, scales, and all of that stuff, that comes later, and it'll make a lot more sense. Right, let's get into the chord construction bit. So I'm going to move quite quickly with this bit as well. So I will assume a knowledge of intervals at this point because you know i've just given you the advice learn about intervals right and i've shown you a few intervals but you want to get a more thorough grounding in it right so next up let's do triads so a triad is one of the most basic chords you can have a dyad but a triad's the one with most of the quality so triad meaning three notes so that's just three notes played together so you think about three notes played together and you know it could be blooming anything couldn't it you know you like stick stick all you know, let's get three notes. You know, <laughs> they're all triads. It's three notes, right? But there is a way that we create triads in uh, traditional um, classical uh, harmony. So we use something called tertian harmony, which is basically the stacking of thirds. You can get quartal harmony as well, which is the stacking of fourths, quintal harmony, which is the stacking of fifths. But for most chords that you see in chord charts, it's called tertian harmony, right? So we're stacking thirds. So we won't discuss augmented thirds and diminished thirds. We're just going to look at the two thirds, major and minor thirds, right? So think about the combination that you can have there. So if we're going to, let's build them from C. There's the C root notes. And we're going to build a C. Uh, well, we're, going to, we're just going to stack some thirds, right? So if we take a major third from the C, what do we get? Well, there's a major third pattern. We've got the E, right? C to E. There's a major third. Now, what if we want to put a minor third on top of it, right? So we're going to measure a minor third from E, which gives us G. C to E, major third. E to G, minor third. So when you can hear about <coughs> stacked thirds, you're getting a third, and then you're putting another one on top like that, right? That is a major triad. A major triad is a major third and a minor third. C to E, E to G. That's it, right? A minor triad is a minor third, so C to E flat, and then from the E flat we have a major third, which gives us the G, E flat to G. So, major triad, major third, minor third, and then from minor triad, minor third, major third. That's it, right? So in terms of the fingering that you're going to use for the most popular of these, for a, a major triad, uh, I'm going to use, uh, let's say from C here, I'm going to play C, E, G, that's our major triad, third fret A string, then second fret, fifth fret on the D string. Again, I'm using the second finger, first, uh, first finger and fourth finger, you can see that. If I add the octave on the top... Okay, so that's a major triad. Then for the minor triad, the most popular is usually starting on your first finger. So first finger, then fourth finger. So third fret, sixth fret on the A string. Then fifth fret on the D string. That's the minor triad. We can add the um, octave on top. So that's the major and minor triad. And that's it. That's how you create these chords. So um, if I was to play those as actual chords, all you do is you take those notes, C, E, and G, and you play them together. So there I've played C, E, G. 15th fret A string, 14th fret on the D string, and 12th fret on the um, G string. Third finger, second finger, first finger. There's a major triad, right? I remember... With the minor triad, we had C, E flat, and G. All we're doing is taking that major triad and we're dropping that third down a half step. So for that, you would usually use fourth finger, second finger, and first finger. So that's 15th fret A string, uh, 13th fret on the D string, and the 12th fret on the G string. Sad. Major happy. <laughs> right? So that's major triad and minor triad. So that's two triads, but there are more triads, right? Because think about it. We had a major third and a minor third. So for the major triad, we had major third and minor third. And then for the minor triad, we had minor third and major third. But there's a couple more combinations, isn't there? There's major third and major third. So we've got the same. And then we've got minor third and minor third. And that gives us two more triads. So if I'm on that C again, 
and I play C to E as a major third, and then we add another major third on top, we get E to G sharp. That's an augmented triad. Okay, sounds rubbish there, but... Okay, so it's a bit spacey. Sci-fi. That's the augmented triad. And then for a diminished triad, C, E flat, G flat. That's minor third and a minor third. That's the evil sounding death chord, right? So we've got four triads. Major third, minor third, minor third, major third, major third, major third, and minor third, minor third. And that's all the combinations of the major third and minor third. See what I said about intervals. Get the intervals down and all this stuff starts to make sense. So, major triad, minor triad, augmented triad, diminished triad, right? So, that covers a lot of different chords that you'll get. Uh, uh, you know, when you see them on a chord chart, you know, if <laughs> covers a lot of pop music. You know, if I was to just use those, the major chord, C major, F major, G major, Add some minor chords in, in a key, so C major, A minor, D minor, G major, okay? Tons and tons of different chords that you'll get just using combinations of major and minor triads. Every now and then you'll get things like augmented. Often used as a kind of passing thing, but you, you get them used in loads of different ways. So that was C major, then C augmented. Um... Uh, diminished, you're often used as a passing chord, so if I'm in C, I could play C major and then C sharp, diminished, and then D minor and then G major, gives us that kind of little jazz standard kind of thing, so C major, okay, so C major, then C sharp, diminished, is a passing chord, it's moving from C up to D, Okay, so that's the uh, that's the basic triads, right? So then we move on to seventh chords. So these are four note chords, and all we do is we add another third on top. So you remember we had major third and minor third. Well, we can on top of that add another major third or minor third, which gives us twice as many. Although one of them is kind of doesn't work, as you'll see. So I'm just going to do this very quickly. So. So if I'm on C major, then C major try it again. C, E, G. That was our major third and minor third. From that G that we've reached, the fifth there, because once, you, once you've uh, created these chords, you pretty much measure the intervals from the root note. So instead of it being major third and minor third, we just say root, major third, perfect fifth, right? Um, it's a lot easier that way. So once we get up to that perfect fifth there, now we can create another chord, with a major third from there, stacking another third. So that would give us C, E, G, B. See, there's that major third pattern on the G. Okay, that's our major seven chord. Root, third, fifth, root, major third, perfect fifth, major seven. Okay, and when you play the chord of it, on bass, you generally take the fifth out because the fifth doesn't really do much because it's a it's a pretty un... It doesn't have much quality, the fifth. It's the fifth is the first one you'll take out. Some of you might have seen my chord lessons on YouTube, the early ones that I did, and people kept asking, why are you playing a, a major chord like that? You know, root, octave, and perfect, uh, and major third or tenth up on the top. And I was... And I mean, you can play it like that, but it was because it's a lot cleaner that way. I can actually play a major chord down here, and I'm taking out the fifth. That's it with the fifth in. But without the fifth, we've got this nice clean octave and then the third on the top, so it still works. You know, you know if I play C major and then F major, you can tell it's an F major chord. G major. Okay, and there again, I've played a C major chord and taken the fifth out. So when you're voicing chords, you can take the fifth out and that gives you a nice voicing. So for that C major seven, C, E, G, B, I just take out the G, so I can have C, E, and B. There's that C major chord. Okay. Same thing again. From that G, we can add a um, 
minor third instead of the major third, which gives us that minor seventh on the top. So C, E, G, B flat. What chord's that? It's a C7, C dominant seven. So for a major triad, we can have a major seventh or a minor seventh on the top, and that's where you get the major seven and the dominant seven chord, right? We can do the same thing for the minor triad. We get to the fifth there, and we add a major third on the top. Okay? So there we get a B, which gives us a minor major seven chord. Then, with the minor seven on the top, we get a minor seven chord. So there's a, a minor major seven, which sounds kind of mysterious. And here's a minor seven. Good old minor seven. Okay, so we've got four different chords there, which are the ones that a lot of people... But, well, hold on. Hold that thought. So we've got a major seven. We've got a dominant seven. That's the bluesy one. Then we've got the minor seven and the minor major seven. Okay? So that's just four of them. That's based on the major and the minor triads. But we can also do the same thing with the augmented. Now, the problem with the augmented is that when we get to the G sharp, if we had a major third on the top, it gets to the octave. So that's not another chord. That's that's just repeating the root note. So that's that doesn't count. But what you can do is have the minor third on the top, which gives us a major seven sharp five chord. So, like I say, I'm going to blitz through these now because... Really what you need to do is then go away and actually l learn them, right? Learn them all. But this is the basic idea behind it, right? So we've got the uh, uh, major 7 sharp 5. And then we also have a non-tertian one where if you then put... It, it doesn't have a, a third in it. Well, I mean, you could call it a diminished third, but it's actually just a second. The augmented chord with the flat 7 on the top which is a 7 sharp 5 or an augmented 7 chord. So that's a, another one. And then for the diminished uh, triad, we can do the same thing again. We can get to that flat 5, the G, uh, the G flat. We can add the major 3rd on the top. Remember how we're stacking the 3rds? Major 3rd on the top, which gives us a minor 7 flat 5. Or instead of that, we can play the minor 3rd, which gives us a diminished seventh interval on the top. So instead of that uh, minus seven, remember what I said earlier? Minus seven, you take that top note down again and get a diminished one. That's what we're getting there. Consecutive minor thirds. C, E flat, G flat, B double flat. I know that sounds really kind of like blah, 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 because it's like a double flat. You've got a diminished seventh. If you're not used to those, it can sound like a, you know, just weird. But um, when you actually look at it in terms of the thirds, it makes a lot more sense because once you get to the G flat and you think, okay, well, I need a minor third from a G flat. What's a third? What's a minor third from a G flat? Alphabetically, G A B. Any kind of third from a G is going to be a B of some kind. So it's it, that's why it's a B double flat, not an A. So um, that's the basic seventh chords, right? So there's basically four triads, and then you get eight seventh chords. So once you've learned those, then the next thing is to, well, you could do added note chords. So we're talking add nine, six chords, which you could also call an add six, or six nine chords, right? So the, this is a, um, these are uh, specifically to do with the triad. So we're not adding notes to a seventh chord. We're just adding notes. We're not extending them. Think about what, uh, you know, the stacking of thirds. We'll call that extending. We're extending triads, right? We're adding notes along to them in extension. Added note chords just add notes to the triad, not the seventh chord, right? So if you take a C major chord, C major triad, and then you put the second in there as well. So we put a D in there. That would be the arpeggio, C, D, E, G. That's an add nine chord, which, which is a really nice chord. So you'll, if I was to play it here, okay, so that's an add nine chord. Close to you by the carpenters, those kind of things. You'll, you, it's that very lush kind of sound. So that's a major triad with an added second, which we call an add nine chord. Remember what I said about ninths and stuff? You know, it's, it's I think it's because it you wouldn't put 
well, you you do sometimes put it in as a cluster with the with this uh, with the root note, but um, I don't know the history behind that chord symbol. But you're basically adding the second, the ninth, and the second are the same when you're doing this kind of stuff because you can put it in any register. Depend, you know, if you're splitting it up between instruments in a in an ensemble, then it's you know it's going to be uh, could be three octaves above. So it's not necessarily just a ninth, but it's called an add nine chord, right? So that's a major triad with an added second, basically, or an added ninth. Then for the uh, the which the next one, the sixth chord, we take that major triad and we add the sixth, the major sixth, which is the A. You know that sound. Okay, rock and roll. So that's a major sixth. Okay, a major sixth chord. It's, it's called a sixth chord. So we've got an add nine chord and a sixth chord. So we've added the the second and the sixth to the major triad. We can add them both together, which gives us a six nine chord. So if you've ever seen a six nine chord, it's when you've got a major triad and you've got the ninth and the sixth both in there at the same time, which um, is hard to play on a, uh, it's, it's basically that. So that's a six nine chord. Uh, and then you can do the same thing for the minors. So you've got um, minor chords, not the uh, minor workers. So you've got the C, so there I've got a C minor triad, add the uh, ninth in there, the D, or the second. Okay, so it's got a cool sound when you add that. Okay, so that's a that's a an add a minor add nine, and then you can do the same thing adding the sixth, and it's a major sixth when you add it to it, not a minor sixth. Uh, that would be a minor add flat nine, uh, flat six. So this one we have C, E flat, G, and then the A, and then up to the C. So remember, no seventh in there. So that's the add nine chords. So, so far, we've got triads. Then we've got the seventh chords. We've got added note chords, where we add notes to the triad. And then you can have extended chords. So when you see stuff like... Um, a ninth, uh, a nine chord, or an eleven chord, or a, a thirteen chord. You know these chords that sound all kinds of, uh, you know, complicated. Um, all we're doing is taking a seventh chord and we're just adding those those notes in there, right? Now, remember what I said about um, about the uh, adding of thirds, okay? So we do them in order, and you basically do them as natural ones. So you kind of kind of pretend that everything's based on a major scale, right, to begin with. So if I was to take a major 7 chord, C, E, G, B, right, if we want a major 9 chord, well, we can ex keep extending up to the up to the D, the ninth, right? So C, E, G, B, D. That's the arpeggio of it. And we can keep adding those thirds diatonically as we go up. So C, E, G, B, D, F. That's adding the 11th in there, so that's a C major 11, which you wouldn't really see that very often because it's it's very dissonant, but up to the uh, up to the F, and then we could keep adding thirds, major third, and that gives us the 13th. So that's a fully extended major 7 chord. So we add the 7th, then the 9th, then the 11th, then the 13th. Remember, the 13th is the same as the 6th. So the 9th is the same as the 2nd, the 11th is the same as the 4th, and the 13th is the same as the 6th. Okay, so that's a major 7th with all its extensions. Now, depending on how you want to play that, I mean, you can't really play those very well on bass, but on piano or something like that, you don't have to add in them all. You know, so if it's a 13 chord, you don't have to have the 11th and the 9th in. You can actually just add the 13th or the 9th, you know, if, if you want to put it in there, you, you wouldn't probably put the 11th in. But how you spread those around is called voicing. It's chord voicing. And yet, you know, generally you want to take out some notes, you know, while keeping the flavor. So that's a, that's a major chord. And then you do the same thing for the other chord. So if I was to take a dominant 7 chord, we can do the same. We go up to the D, the F, and the A. Or we could do it with a minor 7. Add the D, add the F, add the A. Remember what I said about the, they're all major or perfect? When you do it with the minor, the ninth ends up being major. It's a major second that we're adding. The F is, is a perfect eleventh there. And then the A is a major third. Uh, major thirteenth, sorry. So it's a major sixth. So they're all, all those added extensions 
are natural, so the major 9, perfect 11, or major 13th, unless sp uh, stated differently. So this is where altered extensions come in. So hold on, let's just let's just go back over what we've had. Triads, where we just stacked two thirds. Then we had seventh chords, where we stacked another third on top. Added note chords, where we added some notes to the uh, to the triad, and then extended chords, where we are adding the ninth, eleventh, and thirteenth onto the seventh chords. Right. Altered extensions are where you have things like flat nine, sharp eleven, flat thirteen, and that is. That's all we're doing. We're taking those same... So let's say we take that C major 7, right? And then we keep going up to the to the D, the ninth, right? If I flatten that, that's the flat 9. So this is easier with a dominant 7 chord. So we'll do it with the dominant 7, C7, right? So we take a dominant 7 chord, and then we put the uh, ninth there. That would be... If it was a D there, it'd be a C9, right? You just replace the seven with whatever number C9, C11, C13. If it's a C, if if you flatten that D, it's going to be a C7 flat nine, right? Oops, sorry. That's a C7 flat nine. We're just taking that extension and we're flattening it. Uh, if I wanted to play a C7 uh, or a C9, so we'll have the the normal one. And then let's have a sharp 11. So that would be the F there, the 11th, that fourth. We just sharpen it. Okay, you just do that. Let's say that we go up and um, we've gone, we've done the sharp 11. Or let's say we take the, the normal 11. Okay, so C11. So we've got the nine, the normal 9, the normal 11. But we want a flat 13. Okay, so the normal 13 will be A. We flatten it to A flat. That's all there is to it. You learn what your extensions are, the 9, 11th, and 13th. There's only three of them. And then you just flatten or sharpen them depending on what it says in the chord in the chord itself. So if you see a C7, flat 9, sharp 11, flat 13, it's not complicated. It's just you take the 9th and you flatten it. So if it's C, you, t you know, you just it's a D flat. <laughs> and then if it's a sharpened 11th, you know that the 11th is the 4th, which should be F if we're dealing with C. So it'd be an F sharp. And if it's a... Uh, flat 13, remember the 13th is the same as the 6th, which is A, if we're on a C chord. So that's an A flat. And that's all there is to it. So you just take those ones, and then you just flatten or sharpen them. Now, there's a few little extras that you need to add in to all of that when you're reading these chord symbols. But um, that's the basics of it. But remember, even when I got to that at the end, a C7 flat 9, sharp 11 flat 13 chord, right? It's intervals that you're dealing with. Go right back to the beginning of the the lesson I was talking about. It was like, get your intervals down. If you know your intervals, then none of that is going to be complicated. When I was talking about 9th, 11th, and 13th at the end, and some of you probably started going, oh, God. If you, if you knew about intervals, then it wouldn't. It would be really straightforward. So, like I said, intervals are the absolute um, key to all of this. So, so yeah, so you've got... Uh, those as your chord tones. Now, it's also worth mentioning sus chords because they're suspended chords. So, a sus four, we suspend the third and we uh, we change it to a fourth, right? So, if on a C major, there's a C major triad. If I have a C sus four, I remove that E, the third, and I put it on an F. I just move it up to the fourth. And you can hear how it's got that suspended feel. It's called a suspended chord because it's suspended. There you, there's the resolution. Suspension and resolution. There's the... Ba -da! <laughs> Pinball wizard. Crazy little thing called love. There's a, a couple just, just off the top of my head. So you get sus chords all the time, right? So you can suspend... Uh, Pretty much any chord, really. You can do the same thing with, like, if you have a dominant 7 chord, you can suspend it, and, and it's like a 7 sus chord. You'll see that sometimes. So if I take, like, a C7, and then I... I've still got that 7th in there, but I'm turning it... I've, I've taken the 3rd out and turned it to a 4th, and you can hear the suspension again. Okay? So that's the basics of chords and chord symbols. And, you know... I'm doing this really quickly here, but, you know, it's worth mentioning that my Chord Tone Essentials course that's in the sale at the moment 
deep dives into this hardcore. I mean, it really does go deep into it. So, and I take it a lot slower than this. So, you know, I really cover intervals completely. And then we cover every single one of those chords one at a time. There's a lot of tracks in there. So you'll hear the chords. We learn all of the arpeggios. Then in the second module of it, um, we apply all of that all over the neck. So instead of just learning it, you know, like that, you learn it on every note, over every root note, and you learn maybe. Oops. You know, you learn them uh, going up in two octaves. You learn what it's like to come up through the inversions. You know, d different fingerings for them. So instead of just being on a second finger fourth finger, first finger, there's all these different ways of playing them all over the place. And then you can divide, you learn the fretboard by doing that, you know, dividing it up into different areas. Um, so there's all of that. And then in the third module of Chord Tone Essentials, I apply all of that to bass lines and I do it with pop, rock bass lines, reggae, uh, walking bass lines. So we do like a jazz thing, the soul stuff, and I, I sort of analyze them and show how you can then take chord tones and then apply them to, yeah, bass lines. And there's more to it than just learning the chord tones. So I'll just talk about that briefly. So why would you want to learn all of this stuff? I mean, it just sounds like a load of gobbledygook. It just sounds like a load of theory stuff that's not going to be applicable. But Every bass line and every piece of music that you learn, with very few exceptions, are going to be based on chord tones. Even if you hear it playing a scale up and down, all the scale is is just those chord tones with some passing notes. Think about it. We just had a C major triad that we looked at, right? Now have a look at a C major scale. If that was over a C major chord, well... The C, the chord tones of C major are like the scaffolding. It's like the framework. That's like the, the spine of the whole chord, right? Because they're the notes in the chord. So they are the ones that work. They're the ones that will blend nicely. If you've got that chord playing, then C is going to sound nice. E is going to sound nice. And G is going to sound nice because they're in the chord, right? So they're not going to butt up against them. The minute that you put something like an F in there, if I, uh, well, it ends up being suspended. I mean, that, that was that was a bad example because um, it's hard to do on a four-string bass. Let me see if I can do it. Uh, uh, do it without it sounding. There you go. So there's a C major chord. The F is dissonant until you descend down to the A, uh, down to the E. So. All the notes that aren't in the chord have varying degrees of dissonance, which you're going to want to use, but uh, you have to know how to use them. So a C major scale is basically that C major triad, but with the other notes filling in the gaps, right? So, um, yeah, that's the chord tones. You're going to use them in bass lines all the time. So if... So let's say that you've got a bass line. Uh, let's say you've got a chord progression of um, F major, we're in F, F major, and then to uh, B flat and then C, right? So F major. B flat, C. Okay, about the most simple chord progression you can have. F major, B flat, C, and back to F, right? What do you play? If somebody gives you that chord chart and says, okay, well, uh, you know, there's a guitarist and you're in the band and he's, he's got this chord chart, he's made up these chords. You know, he's like, okay, we've got this, we've got this chord progression. What are you going to play? Well, you can play the root note. And, and that works fine. And they are chord tones. You know, the root note is a chord tone just as much as the third or the fifth, right? But if you want to do anything with it, and you want to create any kind of melodic kind of movement, well, the chord tones you know are going to work because they're in the chord. So if you're playing... Okay, that's about as cheesy a bass line as you could possibly hear, but I'm just using... Okay, just using 
the chord tones, right? But you don't have to use them all. You don't have to use arpeggios all the time, using lots of arpeggio movement. The way to practice this really is to start, you know, you could play over a backing track or something like that. If you've got a chord progression like that, you can start adding different um the, the chord tones in isolation so if you've got something let's make it a little bit nicer in terms of the rhythm so if we've got something like a let's let's go back to c so it's easier to um describe so if we've got something like um let's take a one six two five progression right c major a minor d minor and then to g or c major seven a minor seven d minor seven g seven right so Okay, so that's just a, I, I use that chord progression a lot, that, which is basically a rhythm changes like one, six, two, five, because we've got two minor chords in there. So we've got C major, chord one, A minor seven, um, chord six, and then D minor seven, chord two, and G seven for chord five. So it's a one, six, two, five. So I'm just playing a chord uh, bass line around that. Um, C A D G, right? Any old rhythm, right? Well, what you can do then, that that was the root notes. Well, what's another chord tone? If we've, you know, taking those arpeggios that we've just learned. Well, the next one that you want to try adding is the fifth. Because that one doesn't really have much quality to it. It just basically reinforces the root note. So it's dead easy to put in there uh, without having much kind of... Uh, I mean, it's, everybody knows that a fifth is pretty good for these kind of things. You know, it's the, it's the stereotype, isn't it? Root fifth for bass players. So if you're all playing that same thing. So I'm just putting the fifth in there. It's root and fifth. And you can add the octaves in there as well, which gives you, a, you know, a few more notes to play with. So if you're... And however you... you, can, you can, however you want to play them. I mean, some people will say, oh, that's like a... That's that power chord thing, which it is. So that's that's still chord tones. So this is this is what chord tones are about. It's not just about learning about a lot of theory. It's about applying these things one at a time. But then, because we've also got the third in there, we can start adding that in. So. So it's just another note that we've added in there, and the and the main thing that you want to do when you're um, when you're kind of applying these is learning the sound of them because that's going to decide how uh, how you end up kind of putting them into your musical toolbox, you know, the vocabulary that you develop. Because when you're, yeah, you know, some people would say, well, how do you know when to use a third and when to use a fifth? Well. It's down to you. That's the artistic side of it. You learn what that sounds like. Bum, bum, and bum, bum. You learn what those two intervals sound like. But you kind of get a um, almost like a... It's not muscle memory. It's kind of an intuitive kind of va uh, feel for them. So that you know... You know, that A to C, uh, that was the minor third I put in there. That's just using root third and fifth. Um, third in isolation, actually. So there, I, I used the full arpeggio and then went up to the A. I mean, I got a bit out of, a 
bit carried away there going mm. up to there. It sounded a bit naff. But you get the idea. That's just chord tones, right? Now, they're not the be-all and end-all of, of everything, just playing the arpeggios. I mean, that's the most basic thing you can possibly do. But it's that this is what you're doing. You're getting a grounding in it. These are the fundamentals. This isn't complicated stuff. This is about as easy as you, as you, can, as you can do, right? So once you've learned a bit about the... Once you've learned about those, then you can start adding things into there. So that's when you start learning about these melodic devices like passing tones, about uh, chromatic passing tones, uh, neighbor notes, and all that kind of stuff. So instead of just playing, you know, just using those chord tones, you can start adding little uh, chromatic passing uh, leading notes leading into things. Um, I mean, there's, and this starts to get endless, but you start with the chord tones and then you start adding in things like the scale tones afterwards. You start with the foundation of the chord tones because that's the stuff that works. That is the outlining of the chord progression. And then you start to move around the neck, you know, in different ways as and how you feel, right? So that's why you learn chord tones. And why chord tones come before scales. And why intervals come before chord tones. So hopefully that's given you a little bit of a path for what to study. Um, obviously I can't cover everything to do with all of that in an hour. But you get the idea. I've tried to be quick so that you might it might just make you think, Oh, I need to learn about that. Or, oh, that was interesting. Uh, what was that? You know, hopefully, you know, I, I mean, like I say, I've gone a little bit quick. So... Some of you might have been going, uh, uh, I'm not following. But the point being, you learn about intervals. Then you learn about chord construction, about chord tones. You learn to apply them, right? And then you can start adding scale notes and melodic devices and things like that. You start analyzing other people's bass lines. Now, you, you can analyze other people's bass lines while you're doing every single part of that. You can analyze the intervals. You know, when you're learning about intervals, if you learn about a, a seven, you know, it's got a certain sound. And that's a good point. You need to learn how they sound equally as much as what they look like and what the notes are. Just knowing that C to B or G to F sharp is a major seventh doesn't really do anything for you. What you need to do is know that that sounds like... <laughs> you know, it's got a really emotive sound. So you want to know the sound of it. You want to know what the notes are. You want to know what it looks like on the fretboard. You want to know it from every which way, every angle, right? And then as you start playing more and more bass lines, you'll start seeing these things all over the place. Like when I learn a bass line, whatever it is, a basic riff, whatever. I'm just seeing intervals. That's all I'm doing. I'm seeing intervals. I'm seeing the notes as well, because I know the notes on my fretboard, but I see interval patterns. And those interval patterns have a sound in my head. So when I'm, as I'm playing them, I'm kind of singing it in my head as well, because I know what those are. Da -da -da -da. I know before I've played it, or as I'm playing it, what it is that's... What is coming out? Da, 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 da. You, you don't have to work it out. It's just all there because you, you see the intervals, you know how they sound. It all works together. It's just learning music. So hopefully that's helped. Um, I mean, a lot of you probably knew all that anyway because I do a lot of these uh, lessons online. And, you know, there's a, um, the, if you've done the Chord Tone Essentials course, then that will all be old news, you know, because it's, it's all in there. But the Chord Tone Essentials course is the one if you're interested in this stuff. Um, scale Essentials, I could talk about that as well. And like I said, there's a there's a 30% uh, discount on everything at the, at the site at the moment. So we've got that sale on. And I won't be having another sale probably until roughly around... October, November, end of October, early November. So this is the last one for a while. So if you really want it, uh, want to get into that stuff. And bear in mind, that Chord Tone Essentials course is big. It's like the sight reading course is massive. Um, it, you know, it's not just like a thing that you're going to get through in a few days and then that's it. And then, oh, hey, presto, I've learned this. It will take you weeks, weeks, maybe months. With the sight reading course, it'll take years. It's, it's basically you're investing in future practice because it's a load of stuff that you're going to have to work on. It's not just a, ooh, course, and then finished it. Um, so I have to warn you about that because, you know, if you get it and then you think, oh, damn, I thought I was going to learn everything about music in five minutes. <laughs> you won't. So um, 
anyway, I'll leave the um, workshop stuff for now. Um, and I'll just go up a little. I mean, I can't go up through all of these. Everybody's been talking for ages, but I'll just... Uh, right, okay. There's the comments that were about the housing thing. So I'll go below that. Whose picture on your shirt? It's Frank Zappa. I've said it before. Frank Zappa, my hero. He was... Uh, Frank Zappa was my... Uh, was like god to me <laughs> in like uh i mean it always has i wrote a massive dissertation on him for um when i did my degree so i did that uh, it was about 150 200 pages just for an essay on him it was huge uh and i got in touch with all his old his um side men like steve vi and mike keneally and um david okaru was his copyist we got loads and loads of information about his uh the way that he composed and that and did this huge big thing and um you know, I was an absolute zapper nut, um, everything by him. Um, and uh, I don't listen to it as much now, um, but uh, I'll go through stages now. It's like I used to be a huge Queen fan in the 80s, and like um, uh, I'll go through like these binge moments when I'm listening to like Queen or, or whatever. Um, but Zappa is another one of those for me. And Zappa's weird because it's like it's not. It's not one of those things where people would say, oh, uh, what's Zappa like? What do, Will I like that? It, it's like, because it, he does so much stuff, it's really difficult to, um, you know, if somebody asks about him, oh, what kind of stuff does he do? It's like, you've got no answer to it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm a massive Zappa fan. I'm also massively into the Cardiacs, which is a band that you'll probably, well, they're not called the Cardiacs, it's called Cardiacs. But they're a, a band that um, probably a lot of you haven't heard, um, which are kind of like a, if you can imagine like, prog punk kind of crossover <laughs> um although they like to be classed as psychedelic but uh, they're another one that's like i'm a massive fan of i'm also a massive fan of stephen wilson who's um uh who's who is also a massive cardiacs fan so if you like stephen wilson and porcupine tree i'm into all that kind of stuff If you're hot in there, don't move to Houston. No, I don't mind the heat. You know, I worked on a cruise ship for like 13 years, you know, out in the heat, <laughs> you know, playing in the heat, you know, insane heat at times. Um, you'll all know my, I've told the stories all, yeah, I've told all the stories before. But um, yeah, so I, I don't mind heat. Um, it was a bit hot in here because of the lights and everything. And I'm trying to, um, I, did, I just didn't expect it. But um, yeah, I'd prefer the weather um over there to to what we get over here but you know i know that it's not um i know that it's not a perfect solution to anything i know that yeah, i know that um going in you know you get hurricanes and things like that you don't get hurricanes in england uh and i love england um so it's it's one of those it's a it's a real weird one um for us but um you know, most of my business, I suppose, with Talking Bass and that, it's the bulk of it is America. And I have to go out there occasionally to to do things. And it is a pain going over there. And I don't know, I'm kind of ready for a bit of a, a different adventure. Um, going somewhere, you know, going somewhere else. Uh, but, um, you know, if we find somewhere else, I mean, the kids are settled here. So, you know, anyway, it's a, that's a story all itself. Leading tone is a lame name. It should be called a subtonic. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Finding the app great for this. Oh, the uh, Scales um, app, I'm guessing you're talking about. One thing worth mentioning. Is the app, which will be out, out soon. It should have been out earlier, but it's... Uh, I'm just having to go through all the weird stuff with Apple and Google. Basically, if, you, if you've not seen this, because I've only told a few people, uh, we've got the um, Talking Bass app, which is going to be basically the whole website and everything with all of the, um, all the stuff that you can log into now with all the social networking and stuff. It's hard to see because of the glare. Let me try and get it on the side. You see there, right? So if I want to go to the courses... Oops got all those in there and then you go into let's say chord tone essentials and there it is and then you flick down through all the lessons and they're all in there uh, and then there's all the forums and the groups like i said if you've not checked out um talking bass 
recently and you don't know about all of the the forums that we have there now we've got like all the forums and all the groups you can create your own groups you can connect with different people create friendships and all that kind of stuff well it's all going to be here in the app and here's the one of the menus that's in there. i'm trying to get it so that you can sort of see it hold on can i get it oh yeah there we go so all of this stuff so you'll be able to go in and do that on an app uh, and hopefully that'll be coming out soon Within the next few weeks, that is. And it'll be free. Free app. It's on iOS and Android, and it'll be uh, both for phones and for tablets. So it's going to be everything. Um, doo -doo -doo. Right, so that was all when it started. Just blasting down through it. See if there's anybody I know. Every now and then, I'm going to miss somebody, you know, if there's somebody that uh, suddenly appears that I don't know, that I didn't know had come along. Oh, thanks a lot. There's a, a super chat. Who was that? Trommel. Thanks a lot. That was the five, five euros. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, there's a super chat up there. You can, you can pay me money. <laughs> Although you're better off going and buying one of the courses, to be honest. But uh, it's all very, it's, it's nice because there's a lot of people that, I, I have noticed there's people that might not want to buy courses, but they want to, you know, they want to, you know, help out with the channel and stuff. And so that's where this kind of thing comes in really handy, you know, and Patreon and all that. Um, so without having to spend, you know, 70 bucks on a course or whatever. So it's, it's all, uh, it all helps a lot. As I was saying last week with the study group, it's like you would not believe the expenses that you end up with for running a business like this. I mean, it's, I won't go into it, but it gets silly because of, you know, the more people that you have doing these things, you know, visiting the website and that, the more that you have to pay overhead for everything. It's, it gets ridiculous. Um, so much so that that is what would ha that's why a lot of, uh, online companies end up just going bust because you end up getting bigger and bigger and bigger really quickly. But then you have to pay all of the overheads for all of the web space and, and all of the stuff that goes along with that. But then if you have like a drop off, all of a sudden you can't afford, if you have any problems with the finances of that, you can't afford to pay for the stuff that, that is happening because of the website and the website would fold. Like if I wasn't earning anything out of the courses and the, and the, and this kind of stuff, th there would be no talking base because the website would just have to fold because of the, the traffic that I've got there. So it's um, it's one of the things a lot of people don't realize, you know, you know, when you've got people like Scott, you know, selling a lot of, uh, you know, doing the big sell, sell. Um, a lot of the time you really have to, and you have to, there's almost a desperation in it because it's like, man, you've really got to pay for all of this stuff. And it's not like, you know, you're running a, a, a conventional business. What guitar strap are you using? This is a Levi's Leathers. I think it's Levi's, but it's like Le Levi's. Le it's not Levi's, you know, like jeans. It's L-E-V-Y-S. And this is the nicest strap that I've ever used. I love them. They're really good. It's a 4.5 inch one. Um... Oh man, I'm gonna have to go in a second. My missus is going out later on and uh we need to get the kids in bed and everything not yet but uh, i'm gonna have to eat and everything before um when did this start subscribe no alert this time that's don um well it started about an hour and a half ago but um i sent an email out to everybody but the problem is um everybody ends up unsubscribing from the emails you know, like every day, I think I get like about 20 people unsubscribe because, they, you know, they'll get a, a, an email through and then it's like, oh, I don't want this. But then they, they don't see the emails or it goes into the spam box. So um, all of you that have signed up to the website, you really need to check your spam box to check whether I'm whitelisted or not. Right, I've got down to the bit where I was talking about 6-9 chords. I tell you what, I'll go right down to the bottom. Oh, got a load of uh, 
A lot of people. Thanks very much. So that's San Diego Varsity Sports. Thanks a lot for that. Elizabeth Casper, thank you very much. Thanks, Francesco. Got people paying me. <clears throat> Your accent seems to change when you talk about the USA. What? Um, oh, hold on. Let me just go a little bit further up so that I don't miss out too much on people. <coughs> <coughs> That's this. Acid reflux causing problems with my throat. Um, ba 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 ba. So my love to the Isle of Wight, where two great bless players come from. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot. That's, uh, yeah, Mark King lives about a mile down the road from me. We were actually looking at a house that's about five seconds from his house. That's like literally almost, it was, it's just on the adjoining road um, to Mark King. I know where he lives. <laughs> um... Uh, for us bass players, it's all about the bass lines we're producing, the proper timing. Of course, the addresses will be useful for beginning players. Um, yeah, well, the Chord Tone Essentials talks about that in its third module. My courses are all too big. That's another problem that I have. My courses are massive. And um, really, I, I don't know. I should have probably made lots of smaller ones. Chord tones are 1, 3, and 5 degrees of the scale. I was talking about how to choose which major scale to play over a C major triad. There are three modes of the major scale. Uh, that's Robert Ellison. That's not true. Chord tones are not 1, 3, and 5 degrees of the scale. They're created from the intervals, as I was talking about earlier with major and minor intervals. That's the construction of them. You can apply them to scales. So when you're creating um, uh, chords f within a scale, from a scale, on scale degrees then you pick them out but that's not necessarily one three and five what you do then is you have one three five and then you have two four six and then you have three five you know seven and you work through like that but that's not what chords are and again that's one of the things people have problems understanding you don't create chords C chords in themselves like a major triad a major seven chord a minor seven chord they're not created but they're not derived from scales you can have chord scales that you know um, i know that a minor seven and a dorian work together That's, this isn't that but chords themselves are created independently of scales they are their own thing which is why you need to learn intervals then chord tones before you get to scales because then you're kind of doing it in the right order for kind of understanding what they are. If you do it from the scales first, you run into difficulties. I've had loads of people say things where they're making like fundamental errors uh, in, in the way that they're looking at stuff. And you think, ah, you've approached this kind of in the wrong way. One of the best things you can actually do is actually study classical harmony. That's all I learned from classical theory. So that's, you know, because I did all my theory grades and that, and it's all classical. So if you start with classical theory, instead of kind of listening to me, you know, like watching YouTube things from jazzers, it, you're better off starting with the, the where it all, um, where all of that kind of terminology comes from so that then you can understand the intervals and that. And then eventually, once you get through the jazz harmony stuff, it makes a lot more sense. Um... How will I receive the Code Tone Essentials course if I were to get it? You don't receive it. It's, you just log into your uh, Talking Bass um, account and then you go to My Courses and it's all in there. All the videos are embedded, but there's a Dropbox folder, a specific one for that course that you'll get uh, that has all of the PDFs that you download, all the backing tracks that you download. There's like tons of stuff uh, that you download. Uh, but it's all embedded below the videos as well. So every which way that you can have it, it's, it's there. Ah, we have an acquaintance who grew up playing music with Zapper in uh, California. Who's that? Me, you're a legend, absolute top guy. Thank you. I'm guessing that's Anhel Spake. Or is it Angel Spake? Uh... Right, let me get right down to the bottom because I've got to go. So I just need to get down through these last few. Um, da, da, da. 
Do you watch UFC? Who who have you got tonight? Yeah, I'm a big UFC fan. Um, so I, um, in terms of Nick Diaz and um, Robbie Lawler, I don't know. I'm I want Nick to win, but I've I don't know. I'm a bit worried that Robbie's going to sort of overwhelm him. Hopefully, he's still got a chin. I mean, he had an amazing chin, did Nick Diaz, but I'm just, I don't know. Like, I'm biased because I want Nick to win, but, and um, I think Shevchenko will win, and um, although I love Lauren, I think she's great. And then, uh, who else is on? Uh, oh, there's uh, Volkanovsky, isn't there, and, um, and Thingy. Brian Ortega. Um, I want Ortega to win that one. But I don't think he will. If he does, it would probably be like a... Mind you, he put on a masterclass last time out, so he might. So, yeah. And then, boxing-wise, coming up with uh, Usyk and um, Anthony Joshua, I my my pick's going to be um, Joshua, just because he's too big. But Usyk's got skills, so, you know, he could just make him look silly for a while. But Usyk could literally... Usyk could kind of do what... Um, in a way, what uh, Tyson Fury would probably do to uh, Anthony Joshua in, you know, keeping out of the way, uh, keeping his distance and just being, I don't know, he's a lot smaller than Tyson Fury. I don't know. If Joshua nails him, it's good night. Any plans to come to Nam in June? Possibly. I might be coming out with the kids, believe it or not. Um, because we want to check out Houston, we're thinking of coming out, going to... an. I'll come to Nam. The kids, uh, I'll take the kids and Jem around Disneyland because it's right opposite. Because I think Nam is going to be in Anaheim in in June, uh, and then we'll fly over to Houston and we'll go have a look, look around. There's like I'm going to be looking around Woodland, uh, the Woodlands and Sugarland and Katy and a few places like that. So I'm going to have a bit of an expedition out there. So possibly. So if you're there, Skip, we can meet up again. <clears throat> My voice is going now. Thanks, Goose. Um, can you explain the difference you get from using certain type of external preamp versus the base itself? Uh, for example, uh, getting an Olympic base or an Olympic preamp. There won't be any difference. Um, apart from the kind of... Well, I mean, if the preamp's different, then yeah, it'd be different. But a preamp on a base and a preamp externally, there's not that much difference. So it's... Uh, I can't. Blah, I've got to go, so I can't. I can't get into it too much. I'll just get right down to the bottom of these now, so I can say bye. I just actually, I can see a phone call actually at the moment. My missus is trying to get in touch with me, so I do need to go. Uh, uh, it's starting with songs like "Dear Prudence" and working out the baseline. A good approach to learning some music theory. Um, yes, if you apply the music theory. Do, 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 do you want any acoustic basses? Yes, I've got a, a thing over there, but it's not an acoustic. No, no, I don't. No. From Texas, I'm 15 miles down Harbour Boulevard from Disneyland. Cool. And I'm like my best teacher says me. Uh, it's necessary to know all our pigeons. Cool. <laughs> All right, then, everybody, I will get moving, and uh, it's been great to see you all, and uh, hopefully, well, I might do one next week, I might not, I, I don't know, so we'll see. So, I will see you all uh, soon, hopefully. See ya!